Tonight, some late developing news from the world of politics and sports. In New York, Dean Skelos resigning as Senate Majority Leader just a few hours ago. We'll tell you about his replacement and explore how all of this will impact New York State. Then, yet another problem at Indian Point. This time, it is a fire and fuel spill at the troubled nuclear power plant. Now there's renewed efforts to close the place down. And also, just minutes ago, the NFL dropping the hammer, announcing the deflate gate penalties for Tom Brady and the Patriots. Four game suspension, million dollar fine, and two draft picks, including a first rounder, will be taken away. I bet they're not going to be deflating footballs anytime soon. Good evening and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French, and we start here with the swamp of corruption in Albany. <laughs> An excuse to use that animation. Dean Skelos today resigning his leadership post, but he will remain in the state Senate. He is fighting a six-count federal indictment. Prosecutors saying the Skelos used his influence to give companies sweetheart deals, and those companies gave his son Adam both money and jobs. Now, he has been replaced, as we've learned here, by John Flanagan. He represents Suffolk County, also on Long Island. Flanagan, he has been in the Senate for 12 years. Before that, he spent a decade in the Assembly. He had kind words to say about Dean Skelos, and then Skelos congratulated him. So here's the short. Skelos is out, Flanagan's in, but Skelos still in the state Senate, and that's important when it comes to basic math when it relates to the balance of power. I'm going to bring in our panel to explain all these moving parts here. Jeannie Zano, professor of political science at Iona College and professor of campaign management at NYU. Dominic Carter, of course, political journalist and author. Jonathan Yedensbeck, Democratic consultant with the Advance Group and a former executive director for the Kings County Democratic Party. And Andrew Whitman, our senior political correspondent. And, and Jonathan, I'll, I'll start with you in that this was kind of a slow-moving scandal, if you will. A lot of people knew that the feds were looking um, at Skelos. Then came the indictment. Then came um, uh, basically um, A, uh, the promise to stay on. Uh, and he said he was sticking on. Got 16 fellow Republicans to sign a letter saying that they were going to back his play. Then came the threat that said, if you guys try and push me out here, I'll just resign altogether. And the math of that's important because then the balance of power goes up. It's a toss-up, and Klein probably again is the Senate majority. Who the heck knows? This has been an interesting week in Albany. Yeah, absolutely, and there's no doubt. I mean, it's the same playbook as what happened with Shelley Silva, right? He said he was going to stay on. Many people came to his support and said there's no way. This isn't real, blah, blah, blah. They go home to their districts, so they hear from the editorial boards, the newspapers, the media, and all of a sudden the dominoes start to fall, and you see what happened to Silver. The same thing here happens to Skelos. I mean, ultimately, there's a systemic problem up in our state capitol, and real hardcore ethic reforms need to take effect. Otherwise, it's just a matter of time before... You know, might, again, we just had two out of the three men in the room, so I don't think you're going to get to any other serious players here. But, you know, I mean, maybe the governor. I don't know. But, I mean, local, I mean, some of these other elected officials, there's no doubt that no. they're doing well, similar well, things. We'll and come so back to the governor and the silence deafening on this, Andrew. But do the math one more time. Because unlike when Shelley Silver um, went away, maybe not so quietly into the night, his position is whether or not he would stay in the assembly or not um, wasn't that important because obviously the majority is so big for Democrats. But talk about how one seat, if Skelos followed through on his rumored threat here that if you guys kick me out of leadership, I'm leaving altogether, could have thrown this thing into even further chaos. Well, there's only a couple of seats majority for the Republicans outright in the state Senate. And if Skelos had resigned from the Senate, his number two guy, Tom Libis, who is also under federal indictment, by the way, and is of ailing health, might not have been able to come in for a vote. So that would have thrown everything into chaos. There was a movement to have Andrea Stewart-Cousins, who's the Democratic leader, installed as the Senate Majority Leader. That was a possibility. You could have had Jeff Klein with that IDC, the breakaway group that we heard about over the last couple of years. He could have come back into the mix and formed some sort of power-sharing agreement, and he could have wound up, as you said, as the Majority Leader. So there, were, there was this threat that, as it turned out, was a veiled threat on Skelos' behalf. Skelos wanted John Flanagan to replace him. He wanted somebody from Long Island, at least according to reports. That's what he wound up getting, and that's why he's staying in the chamber, so that he can have that vote. 
Dominic's also that's pointed, not why Dominic's also in pointed the out. Dominic's also pointed out. I'll, I'll tell your story. Okay, that, go that ahead. Skello stays in the chamber so he has leverage in case he has to cut a deal with the Fed. Not in case when he has to cut a <laughs> cut a deal. So with I the don't feds. tell your story as well. No, it, it's okay. It's okay. There was never any any possibility of Skellos resigning from the state senate, Richard. As I said on Friday, he's not stupid. He's a lawyer. He knows that if he resigned outright, there was no leverage at all. He's got to deal and negotiate with those feds. But on Flanagan, there's already issues. Let's remember now, a month ago, not not May, uh, as a matter of fact, March, <laughs> a, a month and a half ago, allegations that he has voted for bills that, that, are, that are on behalf of clients. So you made this guy the Senate Majority Leader, and he... There's already and, issues. And tell everybody what that reminds you of, right? Didn't we just go through this in the we assembly? Ju we just went through this. Some of the clients, Cablevision and so on, uh, you know, some major clients. And you're the Senate. So you, <laughs> you're the new Senate Majority Leader. And there's already questions about your ethics. Oh, Carl Hasty, same Carl thing, Hastie. right? Carl Hasty, same exact thing. Except embezzlement in that case, it kind of, we got the whole menu here, Jeannie. <laughs> Listen, um, a couple things. First off, is it curious at all that the silence has been deafening from the uh, governor's office? I haven't heard peep about this. <laughs> it's smart that they haven't said peep. If I was the governor, I would be quiet and do my work because, you know, as was mentioned, you know, he is the third man in the room, and it's unlikely that it rises to that level. But with Preet Bharara, you never know. And certainly, you look at this real estate company, that was Cuomo's number Glenwood, one yep. don donor during the last campaign. So, and they're you know, cooperating there is a, with the Fed. And they're cooperating. There is a money trail there. So I think the smartest thing he can do is be quiet, keep his head down, and keep doing his work on nail salons and other things that he's doing, <laughs> and move forward. Listen, the reality <laughs> is they need strong ethics reform. They need to ban outside income. There's no doubt that when you rise to the level of one of the three men in the room, the three most powerful positions in state government, you inherently, if you're doing other things and you, you have a law firm that does something, even if you're not present there, but you're still taking funds and money from them, I mean, come on. I mean, you're always going to have these conflicts arise. So just put it to bed. Don't allow it. Raise pay and, or, and or ban outside income. Like Congress. Or just have complete transparency so we know where the money's changing hands right now. I mean, the idea that basically corporations, I mean, this was the biggest for me, you're a lobbyist. You come up, um, and, and I'm a lawmaker in Albany. Again, a hypothetical. I, you know, I like myself a little too much for that. But you come up. You're going to testify tomorrow about something. The night before, I'm going to hit you up for a donation. You'll write me a check, and then you're going to come try and appeal to me and my fellow lawmakers, and I'm in leadership right now, and you're going to tell us why um, uh, contributing X or Y of state coffers is a good deal for New York. Why? Of course it's inherently conflict. My only thing is the five of us have seen these things before, maybe not always in Albany. Sometimes it could be the city. Sometimes it could be in national politics and other state capitals. It just has the feeling of a tipping point that everyone's just had it. I mean, you can't even pick replacements and not have them have baggage on this, right? And you can't even go to the number two because he's under indictment, right? And so the whole thing just stinks. Is there a public will to say enough of this? No more. Somebody do something. You know, unfortunately, I don't think so yet. People are frustrated, but people do not vote on these issues, and that's the problem. That's why the reformist has to has to happen, and it can't just be disclosure like we saw in the last budget. It has got to be cutting off outside jobs. Then you got to pay out, them more. People and, don't want to do that. And people don't want to, but you have to at least cut off their outside jobs and pay them more. Disclosure is not going to work because we don't have the enforcement there. So you can't, you know, disclosure is meaningless if you don't have the enforcement. And quite simply, it doesn't work. And you also need campaign finance reform. All of these people are contributing big money to the campaign. Well, who's and that's got part the will to do that, Andrew, or yeah. the self-interest to do that? Nobody. Because of the self-interest that's involved, right. really, you're, you need a, a something that would be up in the hands of voters either by referendum or a constitutional amendment or something to well, that extent. Well, the constitutional convention coming up in for New York State. In 17 or 18, it's, well, it's, it's not that long a few years down the road. But the other thing is, you know, to the points that Jeannie was making, if you're asking voters to split hairs on, you know, whether this sort of transparency or outside income or uh, doubling the income and making it a full-time job, I'm not sure voters are equipped to necessarily delineate, make those delineations and oh, make those decisions. Do yeah. If you want to do something a little more you know, cut and dry, like term limits, that might be something that's digestible for voters and they might be able to support it, although there are lots of arguments against that as well. 
And that's why it's so frustrating, I think, about Governor Cuomo being elected in large part on this issue. Robert and then, drain the swamp. Yeah, and, and then fumbling with the Moreland Commission and having these very weak, you know, ethics reforms. It, it's very frustrating because it's going to take leadership to get this done. Without it, voters can't be expected to vote on this. They simply won't. And you know, Dominic, just for me, if he didn't screw up the Moreland Commission at the end, just think about it. People would be looking at him as the only white knight that was left there, the only person. He could do whatever he wanted. And talking about a national platform, the guy who really drained the swamp and everything else, I mean, the idea of how that was shut down, and if we'll ever learn what really was in the report that was used by the uh, U.S. attorney for these investigations, that's really the genesis of how they've gotten both Skelos and, as we understand here, also Silver. It was through the Moreland Commission. That's the reverse. Richard, I, I know the governor was just recently reelected, but Governor Cuomo has a problem, and it's, it's going to be a reoccurring problem. Three men in the room, you shut down the commission, the Moreland Commission, and two out of the three are criminally indicted. And you're the only one that's left standing. Doesn't look right. With a federal prosecutor standing by. So if I'm the governor, I'm being very, very careful about what's going on. Well, on that note here, uh, as Mr. Bahara said, stay tuned, right? Um, okay, we're going to get next to a big issue uh, that's been going on here. I've been talking about it for the better part of a decade, and yet another headline here that uh, the troubled nuclear power plant didn't need to hear. This time, a fire and a fuel spill, they're bad enough. But when they happen at Indian Point, a power plant surrounded by 20 million people in a 50-mile radius, that's even worse. Up next, the latest problems for IP that are adding fuel to the fire of people who want the place shut down.